Let's do it. Uh, all right. So welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, the final session before the keynote. It is a tough act to follow everything you have seen and all the magic that is happening uh, at Replit. But let me, in, let me uh, bring you in on a little secret. Uh, all of that stuff that you see that's happening on Replit doesn't happen at the snap of somebody's fingers. And it doesn't happen by Amjad sacrificing something. Uh, and it's not just like foo hockey magic happening in the background. It is all the stuff that you're seeing happening are, is a, built from a small but talented team of people coming together for one giant cause. Uh, and that is to bring the next 1 billion creators online. Now, unfortunately, like I said, we can snap our fingers and bring the next 1 billion creators online. So what we have to do is we have to bring a tiny village together and sort of get them focused on solving the problems that can help us bring those 1 billion creators. And so that is what I am hoping to talk to you about today. So to give you a little bit of background, my name is Tabish. Uh, people on the team call me Tab. Uh, I am our head of product. And really what that means is it's a fancy word for a professional cat herder and gap filler. And really what I do is I help the team focus on really the things that will help us get to our goal. Um, and I empower the team with the insights and like essentially like the uh, opportunities that we have to help us reach those 1 billion creators. And so the agenda for today uh, is really, I'm gonna talk about four key things. Uh, the, and the fourth one is kind of like a bonus sneak peek of like how we think about like Replit as a business. The first one of which is everyone is an owner at Replit. Uh, and I'll get into this. And the second one will be, how does radical ownership actually work? Amja talked about this idea of like, everybody building at Replit and we're pioneering. And we do very similar things in the process that we use to build things as well. And that leads into how do bigger projects work that require more than just one person and uh, outside of just Nathan telling jokes. Uh, and then the last one is uh, the bonus slide that I want to share with you is the Replit flywheel. This is how the business powers itself. This is how you, our users, uh, power your own experience and in turn power the product. Uh, and it helps. It's a very, I hate this word, but it's a very synergistic relationship that uh, powers each other. And it's a really beautiful thing to happen. So getting into it first, this idea of everybody is an owner at Replit. What does that really mean? Um, Amjad at the beginning in his talk mentioned that we do things differently here and we're pioneers of like new technology, but we're also pioneers of new processes. The way we say everyone at Replit is an owner is because they embody two characteristics that make them really amicable to the Replit culture. And it is this idea of them being builders. And builder is defined by the Merriam-Webster dictionary as a person who constructs something by putting parts or materials together over a period of time. And the second characteristic is this idea of like hacking. Uh, and so it's the hacking is, again, defined by the Merriam-Webster dictionary, is a usually creatively improvised solution. And so this idea of building things and putting them together to solve a problem or make something work is at the core of how we build at Replit. And this is not limited to any one person. It is not limited to a designer. It is not limited to an engineer. It is not limited to a marketer. It is not limited to Nathan. Uh, it is limited to everybody across the company, which is what sort of brings the full company together in this idea of there are really meaningful problems that we have to go after and we want to go after them as a company or we can go after them as individuals if there's an opportunity for us to do so. And so really what that brings me to is one of the principles that we use to uh, build at Replit. It's this idea of focusing on the problem first. And so we focus on finding the highest impact problems to solve. And we have high conviction that solving these problems will actually provide the most value for you, our users. And if you think about it, a lot of our current work has actually come from this approach. 
Uh, search is actually a great example that Soren talked about, Soren and Reza talked about earlier today, which was we identified that people couldn't find like community stuff uh, on Replit. Uh, this was actually identified by Lincoln uh, on our like platform side. And he was like, I can't find what other people are building and I can't, can't find other users. And so that was an identification of a problem that we then had to go after and go and solve. So with that, I have a prompt for you guys. So what is your like favorite feature on Replit? Um, and I'll probably lean on Lena as well to help me source from the chat, <laughs> see what people come up with. <laughs> multiplayer. Multiplayer is a good one. Uh, so multiplayer was interesting because uh, it happened way before my time. And I'll just actually gave like a demo about it. I talked about how like the first iteration of it uh, wasn't like great. But I think the idea for that actually came from the fact that it was hard to actually collaborate on the code and hard to actually share their code with other people and sort of build in one place. So that was actually an identification of a problem. Uh, and so it was interesting that we highlighted like a problem around the fact that we, people couldn't collaborate. And so it wasn't so much as like, oh, we should build something that's like really cool, but it was more like, oh my God, like collaborating in code would actually be so powerful and it kind of sucks that we can't do that right now. Lena, what else are you seeing? All right, we've got always on. Always on. Always. Uh, <laughs> always community, on. love that. Mm -hmm. Variety of languages and boosts. Yeah, th so these are great examples. So I'll cover the always on one um, and then I'll chat a little bit about community as well. Always On was actually a really interesting one where people were hosting their projects, but they were using a third party service to essentially like keep their like projects like running. And so that was a huge opportunity that we identified, especially for our like hackers who were like paying us. They were like, we need a way to keep our repls like awake. Uh, and we need a way for our repls to like essentially like not die. And that was again another problem that our users were facing. So our users were concerned about the stability and like, uh, and like reliability of their like the programs that they were running and the programs that they were hosting. And so we were like, okay, always on is like an opportunity for us to actually double down. And this is something that impacts a good chunk of our users. So we should. This is a high impact problem that we should solve for. And if and solving for this feels like we would have high, like it would. We have high conviction that solving this will be very powerful for our users. And it's funny, if, uh, if you're a hacker, you may or may not have received an email from me recently about a survey where I asked you to rank some of the features and always on was actually one of the top. <laughs> and so that was a really uh, sort of uh, come to like a roundabout moment where we realized that focusing on always on was a really good thing for us. So moving on, uh, how does radical ownership work? And I've talked about this idea of problem identification a lot already. The re reality of radical ownership is that at Replit is if you see a problem, you just go and fix it. If you can do it by yourself, there's like the culture at Replit is very much uh, like don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness uh, and go and do it yourself. If you find something that you can take care of right away and a search as an example, uh, the project came about at Hack Week. And so Lincoln was like, this is a problem. And he, during Hack Week, he spun up like an elastic search and like, and he had like our, started like hacking away on it with a couple other people, uh, Omar on our design team uh, and like Ferris on like our engineering side. And it was like, we're just gonna like do this. And what other projects have like come about as exists. So I know somebody mentioned draw files. Uh, draw files was something that Jeremy, one of our engineering managers uh, who talked earlier about on the hiring session, he was the one who came up with draw files uh, as a hack project last year. And that was something he just went in, was like, this is something that's really cool. And we've used it internally a fair bit to actually share just like designs um, and just like, sharing stuff across the company has been really valuable through like the draw files that we use. And so this idea of like, if you see something as a problem, if you see something as an opportunity, just go and fix it. 
Um, if you have an idea, get it in front of people. And so the idea of getting in front of people leads to our next principle, which is demo fast and demo often. Think of two scenarios. Think of two scenarios, one where you are doing a demo each time you hit a major milestone and one where you're doing it all the way at the end of like development. Think about what is less pressuring and think about what like makes you like all tense up before you like go and present. That's a rhetorical question. You don't need to answer. I feel like most people would know where the answer is. The idea is if you always demo one, like one thing at a time and you demo each time you hit a milestone, it is a lot less pressurizing and it's easier for you to bring people along for the journey. So the short answer is do it as often as possible and do it fast. Uh, a product demo should take place anytime you hit like a major milestone, you have something meaningful to share. And so demoing when you've like, even just like scoped a problem, uh, we've had for search as an example, the first demo was literally Baron, who's one of our design leads, just talking about what search should look like. There were no prototypes, there were no, uh, POC done, we didn't have a working implementation. It was just talking about what are the core things that people need in, in search. And he was demoing that for, for the full company. And that is really valuable because he's bringing people along for just the problem. And he's requesting feedback on just that specific aspect. And so the next time he does a demo, the next time they do a demo was on the actual um, prototypes and like the actual Figma mocks. And he was showing the UI along with one of our other designers, Emma. And that was really valuable because people already knew what search was gonna solve for. And so now they were able to give feedback on the UI itself and the implementation, what that would look like. And so it helped keep the feedback moving along while bringing everybody along in the company for the journey. And so it was much less pressure than a full demo. Uh, it, people didn't feel like they were caught off guard. And that really helped them feel really connected to like what we're building. And so this now leads to how do bigger projects work? Uh, we talked about this idea of radical ownership. Uh, if somebody can see something that they can take care of, they should go fix it. But what about like big projects? What about the projects that one person can't do themselves? What about when you actually need like support from a lot of different people and you need to manage uh, how that project is gonna run. That's when we think about uh, this, something we call just like our pod process. And so Amja talked about this idea of like, again, like we pioneer, we do things differently. Uh, my background is I come from like YouTube and Google where largely we've always used uh, sprints uh, and we have like a massive backlog and like most places, your engineering and design and product are like delivery teams. But at Replit, we actually feel that when we solve a problem, we have a clear idea of what we're solving for and how we should solve for it. So we start with that idea. Anytime we have an idea, the goal is to go and document it so we can get our thoughts out of our head and onto like paper. And that happens in Replit. We dog food Replit constantly our design docs, a lot of our bots, a lot of our like project retros, they're all hosted on Replit. And so Replit is where we think and we collaborate. And so when we're documenting, we think about two major like questions. It, does it map to one of Replit's like three like focus areas for the year? The three focus areas for the year that we have are ubiquity. So you, you saw in like Lima's presentation and Amjad mentioned it like, this idea of like a Replit native like mobile app. Ubiquity is this idea that you can program anywhere at any time, just making programming more accessible. Mobile directly falls under that. Social and community, how do we empower the community, you guys, to really uh, make the most out of Replit? Uh, the themes work, the publishing and templates work, search as an example, are all direct proponents of uh, social and community as a focus area for us and then extensibility. If you attended Luis's talk on Replit Space, all of that talk 
extensibility is really just a fancy word for like customization and making REPL your own truly. This idea of being able to communicate with other REPLs, uh, customizing your theme, customizing the way REPL looks and feels, that all falls under this umbrella of like extensibility and really truly making REPL your own. So that's like one of the core like things that we look at is like, does the work that we want to do map to one of these three things? Then the second part, and I'll cover this later, is what part of the replica flywheel does it impact? I talked about this a little bit at the beginning, and I'll get to it after this slide. But the replica flywheel, again, is really what powers the business. It really, it's what powers the product. It's what powers the, our users' like, experience. And so it's con continuously thinking about how do we make that better? How do we get more people exposed to it? Um, and how do we do some of our impact sizing, for lack of a better word, like around that? Once we've documented it, we're like off to the races. Uh, we're like, okay, this is a project that seems like we wanna like make a bet on it. Uh, we should go work on it. So we set aside six weeks to build. Now, naturally, all projects don't fit within a six week time frame. But the good thing is that the six weeks allows us to establish a milestone. We have this principle of fixed time variable scope where we're, our, we get really bullish uh, on the core problem that we're solving and we try to fit it to solve within those six weeks. And then the things that are not a high priority or that are nice to have, we kind of think about that as additional and they're not uh, enhancing the user experience in like a super uh, massive way. And so larger projects essentially get broken up into milestones, into those six week milestones. And then smaller projects will try to like clump together uh, that can make those like six weeks together. So you have six weeks to build, you are now heads down, you're thinking about the problem, you're coming up with a solution. So uh, search team as an example was thinking about like their data infrastructure, their data pipelines, what the UI would look like, how would people search, what is the data tracking we need in place? A lot of the different components that need to come together to make search happen. And then after those six weeks, now you're launching. You're launching the feature, you're collecting feedback, you're rolling out to different groups of users, you're looking at our metrics, our numbers, are users liking the feature, how are they using it, uh, how are our metrics trending. And that's really important because the quantitative data gives us a signal as to where the uh, feature is performing from like a usage standpoint. And then there's qualitative feedback that we will also collect. You might have seen uh, Soren's posts on community about profiles and search, which were two features that we just launched recently, asking people for feedback. And so that's what we do. So we'll launch a measure and then we will close the loop with learnings and next steps. Search and Profiles was a great example of this. Uh, both those pods did a project retrospective, which is essentially a look back on the last six to eight weeks on how we built it, what did we learn, what did we not learn, what are things we should watch out for, like what are the learn, like what are next steps, uh, if any, that we should like be wary of, and how do we do that handoff? And then it's we rinse and repeat and we're back into this cycle where if you have an idea, if you can take care of it, go do it yourself. If you need support from a lot of other people, just document it and get it in front of people and just start demoing. We have four demo slots each week, 30 minutes each, that are generally a great place for people to just present the stuff that they're working on and the stuff that they're doing. Uh, it's a really great chance for the company to come together and really just share the stuff that they're working on. The, uh, the last part that I wanted to share is this Replit flywheel. Uh, this says, I've never shared this before, so I'm actually really excited to be sharing this with you guys. This is a lot about how we think about the user experience and the product experience at Replit. If you think about the core creation loop uh, that I guarantee everybody has talked about in every session is uh, this idea of a REPL, right? Like our name of REPL comes from the read eval print loop, which is coincidentally also how our users like work. They 
create and edit a REPL, they then run the REPL and then they see the output. And then they go back to editing the REPL. That is the feedback loop that exists. When you write your code, when you run it, when you see the output, you either get an error, most of the times you get an error, uh, or you get something magical happen. And then you get like a feedback back to yourself to either like edit your code, change it, or you are at the point where you're like, I'm really proud of this creation and you share it. You either share it with your friend or you share it with the community um, or you just like share it like out into the world. And then when you share that, other people see it. And then other people interact with your app. Like they interact with live code. They can see what's under the hood. They can see what you've built and then they can engage with it. They can further share it out. And then that's the consumer loop in the consumer loop. Now they can like, they can fork your REPL. And now they, as a creator are back in the core creation loop, which is so powerful because now they're doing the cycle all over again, just like you did. And so this idea, the other thing that I didn't touch on is the idea of the creator feedback loop. Every time you share the community, the community is giving you feedback around how much they love your REPL or like certain like changes that they would like to see you make to it. That incentivizes you even more to sort of come back and like work on your project and really just build something even better, even more profound and even more amazing. And so now you are continuously like improving your experience by participating in a community, by sharing your projects. The people who are in the community are benefiting from you sharing your projects, from them forking your projects, them creating their own projects. And then I, I think you get the idea, but it's essentially a really uh, self-sustaining loop. Uh, and this is really valuable for us. So a lot of what we think about at Replit is how do we power these loops? Because the more we can power these loops, the better the experience is for you guys. And so that's really where I would like to sort of like end off with you guys. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, like I said, a lot of this ha is magic that happens under the hood. And it's a lot of people that come together to make this happen. Um, with that, there's my email. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my LinkedIn is the same, but uh, I can probably take some questions uh, if there are any. If Lena, if you can help me moderate that. <laughs> Okay, I will, in the meantime, I will scroll through the chat. Um, I, oh, so this is a good question from Paul. Uh, how does radical ownership not lead to burnout? Uh, we actually have not even, not just even policies in place, but also we try to empower the team to ask questions and ask for help. Radical ownership doesn't mean you go off in a corner and you just do things by yourself. You are more than empowered to ask for help uh, you're more than empowered to REPL ask, which is one of our Slack channels is probably is actually one of our like top five most used Slack channels, like all time. A lot of people ask questions. A lot of people ask for help. And that's really valuable because you have a community or, or you work with like a collective of people that really care about just making sure that you're set well, you're well set up for success. Uh, the other thing that I didn't mention on this is that for our pod process, after every six weeks, we actually do something called a cool down period. So two weeks, you can do whatever you want. You can go work on crazy ideas. You can like go fix bugs. Um, and then this is a nod to like our hiring team. We have unlimited vacation, just FYI, uh, in case you were interested, but, uh, yeah, so we have things set up in place, uh, to sort of help people avoid that scenario. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're setting them up well for success. Lena, are you back with us? Uh, yes. <laughs> OK, just had a little <laughs> opening test tone. Um, someone asked if we build Replit on Replit we, in REPL space. We do. So well, so uh, like I said, a lot, some of our bots um, are like built on Replit, uh, like we have like some of our like static pages are hosted on Replit. We potentially have a world in which we are getting closer and closer to that future. Uh, and like I said, like Replit is where we collaborate, is where we think. So 
our like our team uh, REPL is actually all full of like markdown files, which is where we like collaborate on like design docs, uh, which is essentially just like the documents that I talked about earlier. Meeting notes happen are like written in like Replit. Um, and so there are definitely aspects of the Replit experience where we built Replit on Replit. And we are getting closer and closer to that future as each day progresses. All right. There was also another question about, ooh, this is a good one from Codeboy. Does community mm -hmm. feedback play a major part in how Replit is built, which is taken into higher account, community feedback or team feedback? This is a great question. Um, so community feedback absolutely plays a major part in how Replit is built. Um, I called out earlier that Soren uh, basically put out two REPLs in the community uh, asking for feedback on profiles and search, which were just recently launched. And so that was a, a huge sort of way for us to solicit feedback from the community and ask them how they're feeling. Uh, I, we also have like a loyal Replers channel and like a Discord where we ask them for feedback. Um, we don't really take into higher account community feedback or team feedback. The way to get team feedback for us is through our demo process. When we demo to the rest of the company on what we're working on and what we're building, that is our opportunity to solicit feedback from the team. And it happens much earlier in the development process when things aren't actually available to the community. And then once we've actually like launched something and built something, our team of 50 people can't cover the opinions of the 10 million plus users we have on the platform. And so we heavily rely on our community to give us that feedback. Um, and so really trying to understand like, what are the core pain points? Like what are the frustrations? What are things that you enjoy? Uh, and really doubling down on those is definitely like very valuable for us. Tab, I'm really sorry. I've got to jump off and get our keynote speaker onboarded. Yep. Um, but you got it. this. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Lena. Uh, all right. Uh, Mohammed asks, uh, thanks for showing us the behind the scenes process. I assume there are more projects than enough people. How does filtering projects work? Do you, Amjad leadership, veto projects? What role does the PM play in deciding on projects? So this is a great question. Uh, there are definitely more projects than enough people to work on. We actually had uh, a realization last year where we're like, oh my God, we have like, every person's working on like, four, five, eight different things. And so we really need to like whittle that down. Um, and so we basically have this idea of everybody can submit an idea. And then Amjad, myself, a couple of like the engine design leads uh, and a couple other people on, on like lead, on the exec team will figure out what is most highest priority for us. Um, and so we will uh, think about the projects that we want to take on that are Gonna, that are directly in line with what we want to achieve and what we want to focus on. Um, and then those are the ones that we go after. And then we provide that feedback to the rest of the team. It's very open around like what projects we're working on, why we're working on them. And then for your second question around what role does the PM play in deciding on projects is the PMs actually play a very integral role in figuring out what is the user experience actually look like? And like, what is, how do we like measure that user experience? How do we, uh, make sure, how are we thinking about the future of that like user experience? And so the PM job really becomes this idea of what I mentioned at the beginning is this professional like gap filler and cat herder. So making sure everybody's sort of funneling towards like the same goal and they're all aligned around the same mission. That's what becomes really important for us. Uh, and so filling in the gaps around data and things along those lines. Uh, so that's really where like the PMs come in play. Uh, I believe we're at time, so I will let everyone go for the closing keynote, uh, but thank you all for tuning in um, and happy building. <laughs> <laughs>